being bold is really not being fearless, being able to identify your values and think about living a values-driven life. Hello and welcome to Move Conversations. This is your host, Venkat. In this episode, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Luana Marquez, author of Bold Move, a three-step plan to transform anxiety into power. Dr. Marquez is uh, Associate Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry in, uh, at Harvard Medical School. She's also the Phyllis and Jerome Lyle uh, Rappaport uh, MGH Research Scholar for the period 2020 to 2025 at the Mass General Research Institute uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Marquez, thanks for accepting our invitation. Uh, soon after the release of the book, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here with you. Our pleasure indeed. So, you know, in the book, uh, you open with the statement, bold life is a life in which uh, you're showing up fully as you. So what are the key elements that make up uh, showing fully as oneself? So in the book, I talk about this idea that showing up fully as yourself is really being able to identify your values and think about living a values-driven life. Often when we are anxious, we are being driven by our emotions. So we are living this emotion-driven life. So if we're anxious, anxiety tells us not to do something, we walk away and we end up stuck. And so really living a bold life is fully showing up as you, as you know, with our uh, our strengths and our weakness, but really being driven by our internal compasses, which are really our values. Mm -hmm. So elsewhere, you say to live boldly is not to live recklessly, but it is living comfortably uncomfortable life. Uh, you know, nowadays we live in an era which is frequently volatile, uncertain, and complex. So I understand the uncomfortable part of modern life. How to live comfortably in this era? I suppose you're not talking about material comforts here, right? No. So really, you know, I think there's a spectrum between being completely comfortable. For me, being comfortable is sitting at home watching a movie with my five-year-old son and completely okay. uncomfortable when our brain is on fight or flight and we're feeling scared or anxious or fearful. A comfortably right. uncomfortable life is a life in which we are sort of tolerating some emotional distress, but we're doing so to live this bold life. So being bold is really not being fearless. You know, there are moments mm -hmm. I was in New York giving a presentation last week, and before I got to the presentation, lots of things went wrong. The FDR was closed. I got there. I wasn't in the security. Then the IT didn't work. And so I certainly had lots of fear. But I continue to move forward in this comfortably uncomfortable way. And once I started to present, my body calmed down and we get we went, we had a great presentation. But you know, often in moments like that, we are so thrown off that we we just, you know, want to paralyze and freeze. And that's not really a bold life. A bold life is that life that we are sort of moving towards the things that matter the most. Right. And uh, that transformation, um, for that, you propose a three-step plan. So tell us more about that uh, three-step plan. What does it cover? So to transforming desire into power, we really need to first, before I even talk about the three steps, we need to identify what gets us stuck, right? And so the beginning of the book is really about the concept of psychological avoidance. Psychological avoidance is the quick fixes of life. Is anything that we do that brings this comfort down fast, but tends to get us stuck. And so is the person mm -hmm. that gets home in the end of the day and have one too many drinks. Is the person that um, is in a job that they dislike, but the fear of the unknown keeps them stuck. And so once we identify avoidance, then there are three steps, shift, approach, and align. Shift is really designed to change the way we talk to ourselves. Approach mm -hmm. is going towards discomfort instead of moving away from it. And align is living a value-driven life. So in short, shift will be about changing perspective. Uh, approach will be to help you overcome, you know, whatever you're avoiding um, out of some discomfort or fear. 
uh, am I on the right track in understanding? And align yes, yes, is, as you yes. said, right at the beginning, it's about aligning with your personal values. Is my understanding correct so far? A hundred percent, right on point. So, you know, the importance of shifting one's perspective, um, you know, there's also a very famous saying in uh, Indian languages, Hindi and Urdu. Um, it's It goes like this. It says, uh, Nazariya badlo, nazare badal jayenge, which literally means uh, change your perspective and the scenery will change. So can you give us a step-by-step -step method how to change our perspective? I love that saying first. That's great. I should have added that to my book. Um, <laughs> in the next edition, you can. Uh, in the it. next edition, I'll have to add that or, or actually to my next book that I'm writing already um, about transitions because it's really about shifting. So it is you know, often when we're scared, we are like animals with blinders on. Um, our vision becomes sort of catastrophic. We predict the worst case scenario and we predict we can't handle the way it becomes this sort of black and white view of the world and mm -hmm. that kind of scenario we are limiting our possibilities and so to shift is really to pause and first identify what we are saying to ourselves right um in the presentation in new york that i just mentioned the first the minute i got in the car and the fdr was closed my brain was like oh my god they're going to be so angry at you they're going to hate you and that thought alone made me so anxious. And so I had to pause and be like, okay, what information do I have that being a few minutes late will make somebody hate me, right? And, and, and so first, just even understanding that I was saying that to myself. And then the second piece is, you know, what information do I have here? And the only information I had, it was a text from the person saying, don't worry. In, li in real person, like in, in live events, there are always some things that go wrong. We're going to be waiting for you. And so I was able to then shift my perspective from they will hate me to, yeah, they be a little annoyed that I'll be cutting clothes, but they are understanding and they're excited to have me there. And by shifting the way I talk to myself, then what happens is our emotions calm down. We're no longer in that anxious brain or more in our thinking brain. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, uh, what you just talked about in terms of uh, black and white thoughts, you also talk about it and, uh, uh, you know, we elaborate, uh, you know, about like shifting perspective helps you to get uh, unstuck. But uh, I, I want to go a step back. And why do we get stuck in simple either or views of the world, uh, you know, and what are the other distort this if this is a distortion, cognitive distortion, what are the other cognitive distortions that we do? Yeah. So we do things like fortune telling, as I mentioned, predicting the worst case scenario. Um, okay. We catastrophize. Um, we think of the worst, as I, as I said, we, as you mentioned, black and white. And, and see, the brain is really interesting. Our brain hates uncertainty because it takes, uncertainty creates dissonance, right? Dissonance mm -hmm. is when two things don't actually match. I use an example right. in the book of like, if you're walking around and there is a cow, you might have seen that cow, but if that cow starts to meow, not moo, you go, wait a minute, what's happening, right? So <laughs> the brain doesn't like dissonance. So the way the brain predicts then is based on our history, our narrative of the world, the way we are raised. And so, for example, I grew up in Brazil and it had a lot of adversity early on in my life. So my brain wanted to tell me that I'm not enough. That was the lenses by which I work that, that my brain had. And so every time that something good would happen, my brain would transform that into mm -hmm. something actually bad to minimize that dissonance because dissonance makes us feel uncomfortable. And so that's why we end up stuck on those cognitive distortions because the reality is most of us don't even understand that thoughts are not facts. We just assume that what we're saying to ourselves is reality when often is a little distorted. Right. So uh, this leads me to, you know, uh, this, the tendency to distort uh, gives me, you know, a, a, a question which is related to what's going on right now. There is rise of AI and there is so much news, uh, you know, about AI and we, and, People talk about it, about, you know, how AI will impact our professional lives and so on and so forth. And the opinions so far are mostly either AI is amazing or AI is terrifying. AI is a friend or it's a foe, right? Mm -hmm. 
how can we add some shades of color to this view of our world about AI? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and the way you talked about it, it's how I think the world is in general right now in this sort of very polarized this camp or this camp. Um, and I think both can be true a little bit. If you think about it, the components of AI, they are fascinating. And the thing about it, they are scary. And so I think they're both factual because it's a new technology. We're learning how to use it. And, you know, think, let's just contrast it to social media, for example. Right. When right. when we social media really started to rise you know, 10 years ago, we were like, well, we don't know. And now we know the good parts about it. And the not so good parts about it. And we are trying to create some, you know, regulations and things around it to make the best of it come to life. And I imagine that as we go forward, there will be the same thing with AI. And, and you know, to just loop back to our conversation a second ago, I think the campus exists because of fear. When we're scared, we end up sort of in one camp or another instead of shifting our perspective again and trying to look at the good and the bad. Right. So the second skill um, that you talk about in the book and also mentioned in the opening uh, and you recommend is, which you say of in the book that like was taught to you by your grandma, which was about approach, don't avoid. So why do we prefer to avoid challenging situations? And you say each time you avoid, you, you feel a little bit better. So how does that happen? Well, so... You know, we are actually biologically wired to go away from discomfort. Our brain um, does two things. It predicts, as we've been talking about, and it protects right. us. And often it perceives threats, not real threats. So in the example I give in the book um, is when I was 15, I moved in with my grandmother and my brain just assumed that people would make fun of me. The strangers wouldn't like me. I came from a small town and my brain just created this narrative that people were scary. And I was avoiding making friends. I was avoiding talking to strangers because my brain just had this prediction, right? That that was real threat, but it's really perceived threat, not real threat. And so to approach is this idea that we actually go towards discomfort. Now, it's important to, to remember that I'm talking about perceived threats. So I'm not suggesting you run in front of an ambulance, right? I'm suggesting right. that we really go towards discomfort in a way to actually help us overcome it. And, you know, it changed my life, really. It's, I love approaching because of it. Yeah, uh, but, as, uh, you know, the other side of it is while extroverts and ambiverts approach, you know, may work in situations involving people. Um, what about suggestions? You What are the suggestions that you would have uh, for people who avoid certain tasks? right? That's uh, on the surface, task avoidance looks a little different from uh, approaching strangers and also whether we perceive ourselves and behave as extroverts or ambiverts. So let's, let's you know, you have elaborated how you overcame that uh, avoiding stranger part of it. How do we uh, do, you know, manage task avoidance? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because the mechanism is sort of the same, although it looks different. Mm -hmm. You know, people that procrastinate, what happens? They wake up and they say, okay, I'm going to write this email. And then there was probably a narrative in their brain already about they may be uncomfortable, for example, or that, you know, they needed to do something else before. And so they put it off. And putting it off, the task makes you feel better momentarily. You focus on something else that's not as uncomfortable. But then when you go approach the task again, your discomfort actually increases. And so it becomes a chicken and egg problem because you're procrastinating, to, you're, you're avoiding something and you procrastinate, but then procrastination creates anxiety and the anxiety leads to procrastination, right? And so then I find people really being stuck. And so the way you approach this, and I actually do this, I, I often in the morning, the first thing I do is the thing I don't want to do that day. So if there's something okay. on my to-do list, I just take away what psychologists call anticipatory anxiety. Because the anticipatory anxiety is the anxiety you get before a task that's uncomfortable. So if I have to have a tough conversation with somebody, I set up that meeting for the morning. If I okay. have to compose an email that I don't really like, I actually put time on my calendar to do it first thing in the morning. And, and that's a trick that really takes away this anticipatory anxiety. 
And what I've learned is the more you train your brain to approach discomfort, the less discomfort you actually feel. Now, we talked about it already, being bold is not being fearless, right? So there will be some level of discomfort. Having a conversation about asking for a raise or telling somebody you're upset with them or you know, having a tough conversation with your partner, those are gonna have some discomfort, but the longer you avoid, the discomfort just grows. So that's why I suggest approach, not avoid. So for the tasks also, because like, for example, tax filing is uh, for some people is, is a nightmare and they postpone, postpone. And then, then on the last day or last week, uh, they can't get every all the details or papers together and so on and so forth, right? A hundred percent. I mean, it is, I just, I was talking to my brother-in-law yesterday and um, he was supposed to spend the weekend with his kids, his divorce currently, but then he couldn't because he had to do continue education for his job and he left it for the last week. And I was like, Christian, like you had six months to do this. Right. And so, and it just gets worse and worse for people. And so that's why I think for tasks, it's so important to plan ahead and minimize that anticipatory anxiety and really try to go for it first thing in the day. So related to this, can you explain why just do it motto, you know, though it is very famous, great marketing campaign, but it doesn't get it done. Yeah. So, you know, it works for Nike. Um, just do it. <laughs> and sometimes for a run, it works. But if we're thinking about anxiety and avoidance, by the time somebody decides to approach instead of avoiding, my experience is they've been avoiding for a long time. So in your example of taxes, that person avoids the tax every year. And so going black and white leads to more fear because we are dealing with the brain perceiving taxes as something really bad. And so right. really is important to do baby steps. And so if you know, for example, you're procrastinated, trying to change that overnight, it's not going to work. What's going to work is, okay, what can I do to approach difficult tasks every day? And what are the tasks that I feel like I can tolerate approaching without getting to that fight or flight? So if you're avoiding having a conversation with a colleague, for example, they need to have and involve some conflict, trying to just white knuckle through that conversation is not training your brain to approach conflict. And so I might for a week have somebody first on Monday, write down three points they're going to talk about. Then on Tuesday, expand on that first point and what are the details? And then practice that conversation with a friend, for example. And here we are getting the person to face that discomfort, to face the idea of a conversation, to train the conversation before actually having a conversation so that when they get there, they don't get paralyzed. And that's why I say, just do it won't work because we're training the brain. We're not just trying to go for a jog. Yeah, very true. Very true. Um, and in fact, even, even in that, sometimes they tell people that like, you know, wear your track suits, keep your shoes below, the, you know, just yeah. next to the bed and so on. So even uh, it's not 100% sure that like if it works even there, right? You're making certain um, quote unquote approach kind of steps to, to be ready uh, and not to get an excuse or, you know, pop into the brain, etc. Uh, you want to uh, discuss in the book something um, by which I find very important and interesting. You discuss uh, unfavorable and uh, favorable core beliefs. I understand the first type as negative and you know self-critical, and the second type as positive images of oneself, self-images. But you know what's happening nowadays. Again, I wanted to try tie this to what's you know happening nowadays. Thousands of people are getting laid off from top IT companies. Also, mm -hmm. at the other end, thousands of young graduates are entering the job market. When these people uh, make career transitions or enter a new job, new industry, et cetera, how can they use this strategy that you talk about to develop and practice favorable core belief? Great question. So, you know, let's define core beliefs first. Core beliefs are really um, the lenses that we um, develop in our, our lives. They are deeper than the catastrophic black and white uh, cognitive distortions we're talking about. Um, I shared mine already, which is I'm not enough. So that's a belief I developed as a child. So most people don't even understand that their brain's operating with that belief. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a core belief um, that is unfavorable 
like I'm not enough, basically takes in information, changes that information, and then makes it negative versus a core belief of I'm worthy of love or I'm lovable, right? That core belief tends to lead to more resilience. What happens in transitions? It's a, I, I love this question, in fact, because I'm, I'm writing a book on transitions right now. And what happens in transitions is it activates whatever core belief you have right? Because it's a new scenario. The brain does not like uncertainty like I talked about. And so the first thing I'd suggest for anybody entering the job market or, you know, just actually losing a job. I have one of my best friends just actually got laid off. And, you know, she first thing she was like, it's okay. It's okay. And I was like, well, is it really okay? Right? Mm -hmm. It's okay not to be okay in those moments. And then what is the lenses? Is she saying to herself, I'm I'm useless because I got fired, or she's saying, this is an unfortunate situation, but I'm smart and I can get a new job. And so to your point, we have to first identify the core belief because if we don't, we can't change it, right? And in transition, there is a core belief. And so the first thing is listen to yourself, write down some of your thoughts, for example, and, and look at the list of core beliefs and ask, what is my lenses? And then Really practicing actions that are aligned with your core belief is very helpful. So let me give you an example. I had a patient who had a core belief of, you know, she, she said to herself often, she's stupid. Now, she, this woman, I was about to finish her PhD at Harvard in one of the Harvard schools. And so I said to her, okay, let's look at this. I'm stupid and I go to Harvard. And when <laughs> I said it out loud, she went, well, I guess that doesn't close. I said, okay. So <laughs> what kind of people actually go to Harvard? She's like, smart people. I said, okay. So now let's talk about, I know that you don't call yourself smart. I'm not asking to just change overnight. What I'm asking is, are there actions that you take every day that would be consistent with a person who is smart? And she says, yeah, I write papers. I do this. And we created a list. And so really I, I helped her practice actions that aligned with a more favorable core beliefs in such a way that we are boosting that part of her brain, right? It takes a while to change core beliefs. And so it's not going to be overnight, but by practicing actions that align with a more favorable core belief that you imagine about yourself, you're able to then start shifting that. Does that help a little bit? Oh yeah, sure. Sure. I wanted to um, revisit, uh, you know, another point you made at the beginning of this conversation um, you said brain makes faulty predictions. So how does our brain make faulty predictions? And could you share some, you know, thoughts from your own experience when you said that, like, uh, in fact, it was unbelievable for me when I first read it, that when a top journal accepted your paper, you know, your reaction was not what <laughs> anybody would expect it to be. So tell us how did you, you know, react yeah. and how did you deal with it? So, you know, the brain, it's interesting because we're used to like update the operating systems of our computers, but we never think about updating our brains, right? <laughs> and so we like, it's just, it, it, even to me, it took years to really understand that because, you know, my brain had this faulty operating system, which is the lenses, the core belief is I'm not enough. And so I got accepted to this major journal and I was the first first author. And so as an academic, that's a big deal, right? You get really excited. In fact, I didn't put this in the book, but it got accepted without revisions, which is like right. unheard of. Un unheard of. Like, absolutely. Unheard of. And so the paper got accepted. It got accepted without revisions. And I remember I was saying at, at dinner with a friend, and I was like, oh, it only happened because the co-authors are really smart. My brain couldn't let me be smart, right? Because mm -hmm. being smart and being not enough don't go together. And so the brain then changes the narrative to fit this core belief. And it gets us really in a bind because then we are not thriving. We're stuck in this faulty prediction. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, moving on, in your opening remarks, you spoke about a value-driven life, right? Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, you come from Brazil, you know, we are here in, in Asia, whether it's South Asia or Southeast Asia, we all know that people are there in the lower half of the economic pyramid, and they struggle a lot in life for basics, right? Yes. How to align your actions with your values 
if those people face situations where they may lose either career growth or business opportunities if they do that? Yeah, it's not easy. So the first thing I'd say about that is, you know, although today I'm here at Harvard and I have a very successful life, it wasn't always that way. You know, my mom had to hold on three jobs to feed my sister and I, to clothe us, to send us to school. And so when I think about aligning values with action in situations who are really challenging, it doesn't take the challenge away. It just makes every day a little more bearable. You know, for mm -hmm. my mom, education was such an important value. She really felt strongly that whatever it took to get us a good education is what was going to get us out of poverty and into a better life. And so that's why she took two jobs, right? And she right. wasn't happy selling brooms, for example. But what she said to us at that time and still does today was this idea that, you know, it, it, she put us, for example, in a small little English class that we went once a week. Had she not done that, I wouldn't be speaking to you in English today, I think, right? There was a little bit of an ability of her. And so she, I remember her saying things like, it's hard, but we can make it. Education matters. And so what I'd say to people, you know, I work now, all of my research is in, in inner city in the United States. Most of the work I do is bringing the skills in the book into communities of color, communities who have, you know, face um, jail or deportation or diversity. And they ask me that question all the time. And what I'd say is, what, what is the thing that matters the most? Um, I'll give you an example. One time I was working with somebody in inner city, um, a young man who was coming, had been in jail, was out of jail now, he was in the programming, and he was in a park. And somebody from a, he was in a work um, program in a park, he was cleaning this park, and mm -hmm. somebody from a different gang gave him a look, and he had decided he was going to shoot that person. And wow. In the span of 20 minutes before his friend actually brought in a mask and a gun to shoot somebody, he used the skills. He shifted. He said to himself, two things he did. First, he said, well, if I kill this person, then I'm going to be in jail like my father and my grandfather. And at this point, he had a kid. And so the value of being a father was so important to this young man that that day he decided not to shoot somebody. Right? That's where a value-driven life can really halt in this case, amazing. life and death decisions. Right. Amazing, amazing story. Uh, let me ask about uh, people in, you know, certain professions, right? Um, why I'm bringing up this topic is that uh, professional values are also different, right? Let's consider three professions, a soldier, a businessman, and a monk. Uh, their professional values will be very different, right? Uh, yes. You mentioned you do training sessions with people from different walks of life. So have you had training sessions with, let's say, soldiers and uh, read that you had done training sessions with CEOs and businessmen and so on? What realignment helps them to transform their anxieties into power? So it's a great question because you're right. Values are unique to the person, right? And then there is your values. And then there is your cultural values within the system that you leave, right? A soldier has, comes into the military with some, some values, but then there's the military values. And the first thing I'll say about this is this. It's really important to the best you can to have alignment between your personal values and the culture in which you work. Because if there is misalignment there, then you're already actually creating more anxiety. Let me give you an example of this. I, and I shared this in the book. For me, one of my core values is trust. And I had a situation at work where somebody did something that really violated my trust. And that really was difficult for me. I had to spend a good amount of time trying to figure out, can I still work with this person? Can I still work within mm -hmm. this institution? Because that misalignment leads to anxiety, stress, difficulty, sleeping. And so, you know, alignment between your culture and yourself, your work culture and yourself makes you thrive. Right. I've seen people work on company startups where the company's value is innovation. And I see a lot of young people going into those companies because they want innovation. And that alignment makes the day to day so much better. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? 
yeah 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 of course uh, in terms of for, for businessmen it has to be right like you know about profit uh, you know driven businesses and you know what what kind of values they come with and so on um, and soldiers of course we can take this discussion to the extreme where you know uh, if they have to fight and kill an enemy you know what happens mm -hmm. at that point in 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 life so uh, you know how do they face these kinds of situations but like yeah, yeah. but uh, primarily that uh, I, I appreciate what you're saying is that they have to align themselves to the, you know their values and uh, the values of the profession so that they can yeah. continue in that yeah and, and I'll, I'll add one more thing here that I think is important which is you know values change in our career so you're talking about businessmen right I've worked with very powerful businessmen who early Early on in their career, profit and ambition was what mattered. But now they're CEO of mega companies, make a lot of money. And what they want to do now is impact. They want to do something mm -hmm. good for the world. And they want to, mm -hmm. and so I think this alignment is something that we have to continue to work on so that we are not stuck, right? I've seen CEOs come to me and say, I have everything in the world and I'm horribly unhappy. And often they're horribly unhappy because the values that got them to that level of success are no longer the values that matter to them. Right. I mean, the former CEO of Unilever is famous for having like, you know, completely shifted and talked about it uh, and, you know, pushed the company also to move towards doing good for the society and so on and being the force for good and so on. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Right. Uh, another topic that I wanted to bring up uh, was, uh, you know, you learned about uh, mindfulness research from legendary, you know, John Kabat-Zinn himself. So tell us, how can mindfulness and meditation help one to lead a bold life that you talk about? Yeah, I um, I remember the first time I went to see John Kabat-Zinn. So I read his book and I loved um, the work in his book. And so I went to see him in Boston, um, in a workshop. And then I became sort of a groupie. I went to every conference John <laughs> Kevinson would actually um, present on. It's just his presence, being around him, I imagine is what it feels like to be around the Dalai Lama, perhaps even more <laughs> exponential with the Dalai Lama. But um, so, you know, mindfulness and meditation, and, and I loved how he said it's paying attention in the moment, non-judgmentally, right? It settles the brain. It allows us to even observe. We've been talking a lot about shifting. But most of the time, people don't even create space to understand what's happening in their brain. And so I think about mindfulness and meditation as like a fertile soil for a bold life because you're creating space. It's like, I know Deepak Chopra's um, Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, right? To this day, like I love that book because in many ways allows you to really be present, be in the moment. And, and I think about it as sort of dropping in anchors so that you're here. And I think it's a necessary point for a bold life. Okay. Uh, you know, that leads me to yet another question, uh, you know, related to your grandma's wisdom. You know, uh, you mentioned your grandma shaped your thoughts, helped you navigate the world around you in Brazil and later in USA. And uh, you quote her uh, as saying, be the water, not the rock. That sounds like a very Eastern philosophical concept. What did she mean by that? Yeah, my grandmother had so much wisdom. She never went to college, but she read a lot. And, you know, she would say that there are two types of people in the world, especially in transitions mm -hmm. and during moments of change. There are people that are so terrified of change and transition that what they really do is they are, they behave like a rock in the sense is that they want what they have. They're stuck and they don't want change. And so whenever change hits them, they get rigid. They fight it. They're like, this can't happen. And there are people that she said are more like the water, that when life hits your curve, curve ball, when things get, you go around, you go on top of the rock, you go underneath. The water never stops. The water is always moving. And, you know, you may not like the obstacle that's in front of you. None of us like big changes in life, but we can't stop them. All right. And so she would really talk a lot more about this idea of a fluid life. And, and behind this, what I understood eventually as a psychologist, she's really talking about a concept called cognitive flexibility. Which, mm -hmm. you know, the way I think of cognitive flexibility is like yoga for the brain. It's a more flexible brain so that we don't have to just 
thinking black and white ways. We can have alternative ways to see the world. We can approach discomfort. And, you know, I, I've lived my whole life by that principle after my grandmother taught it to me. It's like, well, yeah, I don't like this, but I'm going to go around it. And um, it works for me, at least. No, it's a wonderful uh, concept that uh, you brought to uh, personal life. Uh, you know, uh, I teach a course on managing volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous uh, situations in business. And, uh, you know, many of the famous corporations which have failed to survive today, uh, exactly like that. They were stuck to the old ideas. They wouldn't change. They believed that somehow things will change and their, oh, the way, you know, they were successful in the past, they could continue to do that while they could see that around them, the society has changed, the customer has changed, the clients have changed, their, you know, suppliers have changed, everybody has changed and they wanted to, they wanted to be rock steady. No, <laughs> you know, and the corporations which navigated around it or innovated or went through through that new uh, situation, they are the ones which we see them as surviving today, right? So tra the transition that you talk about, the transformation that you talk about, and adaptability, flexibility, uh, you know, absolutely essential. And it's true for corporations, it's true for us, right? That is so true. That is, that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the other famous quotes uh, from the book, uh, you know, in your book from the book, The Alchemist, uh, is like, when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. Uh, such an inspirational sentence, uh, say mm -hmm. that it was immortalized in a Bollywood movie. The name of the movie is called Chuck Day India. And this is about a hockey coach uh, training uh, in a women's hockey team in India to win a championship. And he inspires them with this statement. He says that in, in Hindi, of course. So, and just, you know, awesome to read that in your book. So from your life experience, how did the universe conspire in helping you to achieve what you have achieved? It's, you know, I, I say often that I know my why, which are my values. I know my what, which is professionally what I do. The how, I believe that God has a higher power, whatever that person believes. I believe in God, and so I believe God has that. And, and that's what I think happens is when you let go of control of the how, and I'm not suggesting that you're not ambitious. I'm suggesting that you sort of understand that you don't have all the answers, right? But if you're moving towards what your values and your purpose, like everybody has a gift to give in the world. And if you're moving towards that, then the universe comes back. Like, I, I'll give you an example of this. It just happened. I was, um, I was speaking at a Formula One event in Miami. And, you know, the two books that have shaped my life was The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. And the second one was The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success by Deepak Chopra. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were the two people I really want to meet in my life. And I was speaking. And then the other person speaking that was Gotten Chopra, Deepak's son. And so I met him and I met somebody else, David, who manages Deepak's stuff. And he's like, I will make sure you meet Deepak. And so I haven't met him yet. But that's an example of the universe conspiring in such a way that it's like, I, I wasn't saying to myself, I wanted to meet Deepak, but, you know, is the universe coming together, especially this moment in my life with this book? And, you know, it's so exciting, but I can't tell you, it's so nerve wracking to have this out in the world. It's such a personal book to me. And then the universe is bringing people like you and other people together Thank to you. sort of elevate this. And, and so... Even being here with you, I understand in Singapore, right? Like we're across yep. the world and we are coming together. That's the universe conspiring in my mind. Absolutely. I mean, that's a brilliant answer. You know, very touching and moving how uh, things have happened. You, you talked about your own trans, you know, life from a small town in Brazil to Harvard. Uh, it's it's amazing. And, uh, you know, it. we had a great conversations that move conversations and we hope that like you know we would be able to take some uh as well you know some good uh inspiring tales as well as some plans uh, to make a bold move uh, forward in our life and maybe able to make a bold life in the future uh, and i hope that uh, our listeners and viewers would benefit from it uh thank you thank you so much uh dr marcus 
Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been such a lovely conversation. Thank you so much for reaching out and for um, being so prepared for this amazing conversation. Thank you. No, it's, it's our honor. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in yet another episode of Move Conversations. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to the Move Conversations YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications of new episodes. Thank you very much. Till I see you in the next episode. Thank you very much. Have a great day.